what really high quality design is, it ends up being this robust back and forth dialogue that, that we have with our clients. Business of Architecture, episode 366. Hello, and welcome back, Architect Nation. I'm Enoch Sears, and this is the show where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for running a profitable and impactful architecture practice. This podcast is produced by Business of Architecture, the leading business consultancy for architects that helps them structure their practice for freedom, creative fulfillment, and financial reward. Architect Peter Tui runs a residential architecture practice in Baltimore, Maryland. And over the past 16 years, Peter's gone from designing basements and porches to being recognized as one of Baltimore's premier architects. Today, Peter shares lessons learned building his firm, as well as a powerful strategy he's using to win better clients and earn the fees that he deserves for his creative work. Hello, Peter, and welcome back to the Business of Architecture podcast. Hi, Nick. How are you? I'm doing excellent. And I'd like to just, let's fill in our listeners on how we got introduced and started working together because we've known each other for quite a long time now. And it's been fun to see you as you've developed and grown your practice and what you're getting into now. I think it'd be great to just talk about how you and I first came in touch. Yeah, so that was a long time ago. And the, the I actually went back and looked. So I was episode 92. I don't know what the episode this will be, but that's, uh, but I feel honored to be, um, Ask back, you know, so, so to me, it's a, it's nice. But the, the first time we met was I signed up for a business of architecture thing uh, had to be like seven or 10 years ago. And, um, and then we got to talking and, and the way that my firm came about was interesting. And that's what we talked about in the first one, which I still think is interesting. You know, I was taken under the wing of this other architect, moved into his office, but opened my own office in that space. And so I used all of his um, documents and his, he would he became my mentor for, still is. Um, and so it was just an amazing way to start a firm because architects will tell you that the chances of them going out of business because they're bad architects is almost nothing. But the chance of going out of business because you've made a business mistake, well, that's all of it. And so I wasn't given the opportunity to make a business mistake. That, and that's what that 92 episode is, which is, which is good. But before we even get started, I, I want to do my thank you. So, Enoch, you've been my exercise partner for the better part of a decade. And, uh, and so I, I get on, I live right on this trail that goes from my house 20 miles all the way to Pennsylvania. And so if I'm on my bike or if I'm jogging or doing anything, I got a Business of Architecture podcast going. And in particular, so Julia Nagel was a recent one and she was great. So I really liked her, you know, that, uh, you know, smart, the way she described it was, um, rigorously understanding and with authority command the responsibilities you have in the office. I wrote it down. I thought it was, I just thought she looked like a really impressive architect, but an even better person. So that was great. Brian McCartney's was great. I just, I just, every single time I'm, I'm always impressed. So thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you for that, Peter. Mm -hmm. Now in your own right, you are, uh, you're doing some amazing work. Um, you know, you do some amazing, amazing private residences mm -hmm. and I mean, you, you're really doing, doing fantastic work. So I encourage all of our listeners to go out and, and, and check out your work. And particularly, I, I, I'm really glad that you brought up the podcast episode where you shared with us how you went into private practice, mm -hmm. because I remember at the time thinking that was really ingenious. A lot of architects, when they start their practices, of course, they don't have the runway, they don't have a lot of funds and the way you did it was just brilliant to be able to minimize the risk of yeah. failure, minimize the risk of the large investment of doing that while having kind of a safe place, a safe launch pad to do it from. Yeah, it's one that I think is really repeatable too. I have to say I have not repeated it for somebody else because of there's a whole list of reasons, but the pandemic not really being one of them, but it's now one. Um, but, the, but the point is that it's, uh, I think it's probably the easiest way for a firm owner that's got a desk space to just, I mean, there, there's no liability. This other person comes in and, uh, and it just is, I think it's a win-win both ways around. So 
Um, so I'll tune in, like, so episode 700 and something will be me being the mentor. So we'll, we'll look forward there to it. There we that. go. And speaking of mentor, Peter, I know that over the years you've had a team and then you had not had a team. Are you working solo right now or do you have a team? Yeah, so I have, uh, I use two other architects. Uh, so PLM Architects, we work together when I'm doing projects in New Jersey. Her name's Patty. She's great. And then Chris has been my right-hand man for, got to be getting close to eight years now. And, um, and so what he does is he models the, um, the homes in 3d. And then somewhere about five years ago, he started to transform those models so that they're simultaneously permit drawings, right? So we take a section and that section's a permit drawing section, but they're also virtual reality sections so that, that I can use that, that model in, you know, we use twin motion. There's a couple of, of uh, options there, but twin motion, if you're an ARCHICAD user uh, and you pay the monthly subscription is free. So, you know, they, the, it's an amazing software and it's free. And uh, so anyway, but Chris does this, this tightrope balancing act of, of literally making it for both permit drawings and you know, and the virtual reality so that we start at uh, concept design and it's a straight line to to the uh, permit drawings with virtual reality being these little bumps, not big bumps, little bumps on the road. So anyway, but we'll we'll talk about that. So it's really just the three of us. So that's it. Um, Got it. And Peter, I'd like to ask you. So one of the questions that I get a lot mm -hmm. from architects and I've thought a lot about myself, which is is the sole practitioner model, is it sustainable, is it doable, not just to survive, but actually to make a really great income and do good work as a sole practitioner in the residential space? What is your perspective on that? Well, so technically I would say I'm, uh, technically I am a sole practitioner, right? That's the, the technical. Having said that, I'm not. Um, you know, Chris and I are, um, are two halves to a whole. Right. I couldn't do with the, the same level of expertise what Chris does and Chris can't do with the same level of expertise what I do. So to me, that's a um, um, so but I'm I would be willing to wager there are people out there. Having said that, the key is to get the projects that, you know, create the demand so that people are coming to me, really. And, um, and once you get that rolling, then the answer is yes, but not until. So, you know, I had probably, um, yeah, I've been in, actually on April Fool's Day will be my 16th uh, anniversary. So the Sweet 16 party for 2E Architects is this April Fool's Day. Uh, Sweet wow. 16, never been kissed, right? And, um, yeah. and so the, so that's, and I would say the first, oh, I don't know six, five years, you know, before I met you. Right. And, uh, and, and so what, you know, I was doing basements, really anything that anyone had for me. And it was a pretty rough transition for me personally, because I had been working on multi-million dollar homes, 18,000 square feet was the biggest. I mean, that, that, that was a big home. And, um, and the, uh, and then I go from that to basements, you know, front, I did a front porch <laughs> And, um, and then slowly the work ramped up and then, you know, I, I did a net zero house and that got a lot of press and then more and more and more and more. So, but it's, um, it, it, it's, it's rough. I've, I've actually really appreciated the community that I'm now a part of, you know, because of the people that I met through you. So, you know, I do the AMI mastermind. I'm still in that and, uh, as a mentor now, and it's just as a, it's just a, a, for me, again, as a sole practitioner, like you're, you're talking about thriving. And part of the way I thrive is with the interaction and the interaction I, I don't have as a sole practitioner, really. So that, that's an important part. And, and, uh, you know, I've, I've made friends, I've traveled to these people's offices and, and, you know, when I'm on vacation, um, I met Kurt Kruger through you and I was in LA flying to wherever, I don't remember. And um, actually, I do New Zealand, and um, and so we stopped for a day and saw Kurt, saw what he was working on. I've I've been to you know other people's offices too. It's just it's just been wonderful. So that's part of the thriving is to create the you know you got to make the right money, you have to have the right clients, 
but you also have to have the right environment. And for me, now I have all three. So I'm, so I would say that's fantastic. That's fantastic. Peter, as you look back at your work, you know, you talked about starting to do basements and then to where you are now, Mm -hmm. has there along the years, have there been any, any, any larger jumps, things that happen that kind of spit up that trajectory? I'm, I'm always looking for the small levers that, that, that swing the big doors. For instance, someone who's doing the basements in porches right now or maybe just mediocre homes, mm-hmm. what can they do to accelerate that? Yeah, so, so what I did was, again, it was uh, through AMI, you know, I started marketing. But I don't market the way that, you know, it's like a, a car salesman markets. I educate people. And so my website is is a pretty powerful tool for me because it's one of the best, it might even be the best website from a from a SEO perspective in Baltimore. So I know that's not a very big uh, ocean, but it's the ocean I'm in. So, um, and the way I've done that is create a lot of content that people download, Google sees that, and, um, and people have downloaded it all over the world. And I said 49 of all the 50 states, come on, anyone in Nebraska, you can do it. Um, but the, uh, but it's, interesting to so that helped me get the this higher trajectory you know that that you know okay. the, the whole idea is that you want to be saying no to more projects than you say yes to right and i've got that and i've had that for oh probably the last seven years something like that and it's been pretty consistent so um you know the i had a a, a client come in they wanted to do a huge house and he was a jerk. I'm just trying to be nice. And that's the nicest word I can use to describe him. Um, and I just said, no, I don't, I don't need the work. And it was a great project in a great area. And I just don't have time for jerks. So, uh, and, and it, the funny part about the whole thing was his wife was super nice. And, um, and she didn't want me to meet her husband. And once I met him, I knew why. <laughs> And, and <laughs> right, so why they were anyway, whatever. So, so, but, but again, it's like, uh, you know, you're doing well when you start saying no to crappy projects. You don't have to take crappy projects. You know, you're doing really well when you say no to great projects with crappy people. So, I love that. I love that measure of uh, that kind of criteria. Yeah, it's, it's, Peter, you've been an early adopter of virtual reality. And that's one of the reasons why we wanted to reach out and have you on the yeah. show today was to kind of talk a bit about that. When did you start getting into virtual reality in terms of we're talking about, you know, as a, as a visualization tool? Right. So, so I use Archicad and they, um, they had this offer where Twin Motion is their virtual reality environment. Lumion's another one. There's, I think there's a third. Um, and so I, I tried it out and, and it was actually, um, a friend of mine who does some work with me, his name's uh, Henry Berger, said you know, he saw the 3D models. We make a very good 3D model. And, uh, and, and we use that at the time for unlimited three-dimensional drawings, which was, that, that's an amazing leap in technology. And I thought that was going to be enough. I really did. Um, and, and Henry saw this and he goes, wow, we could put that into virtual reality uh, today. We could do that today. And so we did, and it didn't go quite as easily as Henry thought it would. Um, so, but it was, um, but we could see the potential uh, because it's, you, you put on the goggles, I'm right here. you put on the goggles and you're in the house. I mean, there's no mistaking. It's, it's, it's amazing. And the, um, and then you look around, you're like, oh, like that surface or that material or this, whatever, not right. And, you know, figuring out how to get north to align with north, that was an issue and, 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 and an important one, because one of the things we do is show a complete day's worth of sun in like, say, 30 seconds. So here's, a, you know, in the, the day's worth of sun in your kitchen. Uh, so here that, that's noon, you know, all this or that's all the morning light coming in or whatever. And then, you know, the same we can do that anywhere. You know, here's the same thing at, at your pool. Are you going to get sunlight? Where are you going to go get that, you know, uh, savage tan? Um, or how are you going to avoid getting sunburn? Same question, really. And, uh, and, and we show our clients that. So north was critical and north at the Baltimore latitude. So, again, we've figured out how to do that. But it was a long s- slog up that hill because there was nobody really teaching that t- at the time. 
um, because it was all just new. So, you know, we were making stuff up and some, some of the things we did worked, some of them didn't. Um, and then, you know, then Chris and I would get together and I would basically complain. <laughs> so I'm good at that. And, um, and then Chris would think, huh, I wonder if I could solve that in ARCHICAD. And then about half of everything he could, maybe more. And then, you know, slowly we were getting better at this. And, um, and now we've got it down. It's really exciting. You know, the, uh, um, yeah, but, and, it, and I, I guess I want to share with people a little bit of the, um, you know, reasons to do virtual reality, you know, so the, the first one is, you know, for me, it's so important to attract clients that are passionate about design, right? That's what I am. And I want them to match or at least come close to that level of passion. And people who are interested in virtual reality do that. You know, they, they see what they've been missing. So they, they're leaning into the technology. Um, and the best part about it is that there are some people sort of on the fence. They're, you know, sort of passionate about the budget, but now we can elevate them to, they're not going to not be passionate about the budget, but they can add passion, you know, for the design to that. And I think it's because the budget's pretty easy to understand. You add up all the numbers and it's either the right number at the bottom or it isn't, but we can, and we can play with the numbers. What if we do this? And what if we do that? And, and people can understand it. But with the design, you know, you look at the drawing and, you know, you get like, I don't know, 80%, something like that, more, not too much more. But now with virtual reality, you get 100%. And you're know, like, oh, I didn't realize that that was going to be this tall or something like that. Um, and they, and people like, you know, when they put the goggles on them, they're kind of reaching and it's just, it's, it's, and they're, you know, I get this all the time where they lift the goggles up and this is amazing. And then they put them back in. Yeah. What is, I'm interested in that, in that reaction that people have. So, Obviously, looking at a 2D drawing, you and I with an architectural background, there's going to be a certain element of we're, we're spatially visualizing the space. And, right. and I'm just curious what it's like for a, a, a non-trained designer slash architect. What is it like for them to actually be able to suddenly go for maybe maybe even just a rendering, a 2D rendering, and then putting that on? Are, are they what, what do they say about the fact that they couldn't see it before and now they do? Any? I'd be curious to know what they're saying. They, I see the same thing time and again. So what, what happens is I, I think our clients, and, and by our, I think every architect, our clients understand the plans pretty well. You know, they can see sort of openness by lack of walls. They can see size, relationship, all that. And then we show them a, a, an elevation and they, 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 you know, we can make a beautiful drawing, beautiful drawing of an ugly home. That's not that hard to do. So... Right. And so the uh, and, and it's uh, it's about proportion, how close things are and all that. And so they, we, we lose them a little bit there and maybe more than a little. And then we show them a section and, you know, which is one of the most important parts to describing the volume of the interior, which is where you live. Um, and we lose them even more for that. And so they're, they're pretty good at, at understanding, again, the plans. And then I do the you know, I show them you know, an exterior rendering and they get comfortable, you know, it's a 3D thing. And then they go in after that, they go into the virtual reality. And I, I get the, like, you know, this huge smile, huge smile. And then they lift up the goggles every time. And I get a, you know, this is amazing. Wow. Oh, I, now I see it, you know, like that. Um, and it's just, and, and the thing we always have to remind ourselves is that, you know, in order to afford me, right, you have to be pretty smart. So you're probably smarter than I am. <laughs> and, you know, but the visualizing three dimensions part, that's not so easy. So, and it's, and again, it's a training. It, it's, it's like um, if we were exercising with, with weights and you could, you could work out and get stronger at this, but if you never work out and people never visualize in three dimensions, so they're never working out, then you, you, you know, that muscle sort of atrophies. I would suspect that the children of my clients, you know, the young children, the eight-year-olds visualize better than their parents do because they're still thinking about, like, imagine, you know, the uh, a castle. Oh, okay. And then, and then they do. Right. Perfect sense. I mean, Minecraft, you know, they're just imagining what they're going to build. That, mm -hmm. that makes perfect sense. Yeah. So you gave us, you gave us a number, I'm curious, you gave us the number one reason why you think it's VR's, important, which is to connect with clients who actually value design. Right. Two, the second one is it's a huge competitive advantage, right? So, you know, when you're 
um, because you but know why why go on, Peter? Why tell us more? <laughs> It's a competitive advantage. <laughs> no, there's there's more actually. I'm I'm bearing the okay. lead. So the so the, the the thing that we all have is um, as as architects, there's we're all going after the best clients, right? And and what we what we want is whatever that is. And different people describe that differently. Some commercial, some residential, some whatever. Um, but there's a limited number of the best clients. So. We want to win the highest percentage of the best clients. So how do you do that? And uh, and there's there's ways of talking to people, and and certainly you have to create an atmosphere where a client feels uh, safe, and they they feel like they you're going to exceed their expectations and all that. And and you can do that without virtual reality. Obviously, people have done it without virtual reality for a thousand years more, but. Once you add virtual reality, now what, what's happened is you've sort of tilted the balance. So I can easily imagine nowadays uh, going up against uh, an architect that's even more talented than I am, right, and winning that commission because my whiz bang presentation there, like, uh, so, you know, I, I'll interview a client uh, for a short amount of time and then they'll say, da, 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 whatever it is, contemporary. Uh, okay, here's a virtual reality contemporary home put on the goggles. Uh, and then Peter, shut up. Like, you don't have to say a single word. Like, and then they'll, and, and um, when they're in virtual reality, I'm looking at what on a screen to see what they're seeing. And, uh, and I can guide them. Okay. So now here's where you're going to want to go. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it, it's, it's amazing. And it's like every once in a while, someone will, will, will do this a lot. It's like, okay, sh- just slow down. Slow down. So when you said do this for people who are just listening, you're looking around like yeah. they're just scanning everywhere, right? Right, because they're a, a little overwhelmed, and yeah. um, and the uh, and so so that you know then I say slow down because I'm watching them on the screen and I can see how fast it's going. And so I just slow down. Now, just, you're gonna get seasick. Has yeah. that ever happened? Uh, it it used to. So we upgraded the the goggles after the first client did get seasick. Um, and, you know, because they did the same thing of, of moving quickly. And then the, and then the, the vision kind of catches up after they, they've moved. And so, you know, we get them to slow down. And then what I do is I just tell them to focus on something. Oh, ahead and to the right, that's the, that's the kitchen island. And then they look at it. Oh. And then so it settles them down. Now look behind that. You can see whatever it is. And um, so that, that's what I do, to again, to slow them down. And, and to help guide them through the experience. And then I'll move them through, the, you know, virtual reality. What you do is you, you're standing like in an area. And in my office over there, I'm pointing to the right. Um, I've got about a probably 18 by 12 area that I've got just a couple of like uh, pieces of furniture. And I just move those out of the way. And that's our virtual reality environment. And, um, and it's perfect for that because they, they can walk around a little bit. And then, um, and then I'll sort of, you know, beam them as Scotty would do to Kirk to the next room. So I point where they where they want to go, and then I then they go there, uh, and then they walk around there for a while. And uh, and if they're getting close to a wall, they get this blue, um, an actual physical wall. They get this blue grid that that says, "Oh, now you've wandered too close to," so you, the, you know, nobody gets hurt, which is so far been the case. Um, and, you know, so that that's it's just it's it's just a lot of fun. And 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 they, you know, and people talk about it, you know, the um, you know, so my one of my favorite um, stories is one of my clients came back to me like not even a week later and said, I totally owned the dinner party on Saturday. I'm like, you what? <laughs> right. And, and it was it was funny because because she's a funny client, by the way. And um and I had no idea that dinner parties were competitive events, were they? <laughs> and, and you haven't been to many dinner parties. Yeah, not before. enough. I'm, I'm clearly, uh, <laughs> I, I've been doing it wrong all these years. So, uh, so it was just very interesting um, that, you know, people just get that excited about it. And, uh, and, and, yeah. um, and again, what, what I like about it takes that person who's passionate about the, the design and sort of elevates them from client to almost a collaborator because because when as an architect i would if, if somebody said oh i think that's too big or too small or too left or too right or anything 
um, I would always wonder, did they understand the drawings and do they actually mean exactly what they said? I understood what they said, but do they understand the, and with virtual reality, there's no questioning it. If they, if they, if they walk into a virtual reality room and it's too tall for them, it's too tall. And, and uh, you know, whereas if you look at a section and they say it's too tall for me, now I wonder, is it too tall or is it not too tall? I, 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 there's no way to know because I know they don't know. You know, for me, what, what really high quality design is, it ends up being this robust back and forth dialogue that, that we have with our clients. And, you know, we're trying to, you know, make their dreams come true, but, but, but elevate the dreams at the same time so that they you know, just can't believe how lucky they are. That, that's, the, that's the goal. And I think that's the goal really for every architect, every project, residential, commercial. Um, I did some work and, and designed a, some synagogues years and years ago. And that was my goal then too, is to make, um, make that, you know, walking into those synagogues an experience that people, um, you know, were moved, right? This is a, a place of worship, right? This is, a, this is serious. And... Um, and get that, you know, that, that feel too. So, so that, that's always the goal. So the, so I do think it's a, so the first one was attract clients passion about the design. Second virtual reality reason is again, to create that distinct competitive advantage already enough. Right. But the third one is higher fees. Right. So, so I kind of buried the lead there a little bit. Um, when you, offer virtual reality, people expect to pay more. You know, they, uh, you know, we don't, I haven't argued about a fee in forever. I don't even remember last time. And if someone tries to, then I just say, no, see you later. And, um, and so it's not a, it, it just to me is, is a real, like that's the cake and the icing on the cake. Um, so when you asked initially, um, you know, what can you do to sort of get the, um, you know, to where I was, to where I am, I think virtual reality might be the shortcut right now, you know, and maybe the yeah, shortcut. That's will, fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. So the, and, and then we, then I, there, I've, I kind of like two more reasons and they're, they're really one. And we kind of have talked about it is that, you know, we so exceed our clients' expectations that, uh, which is already a reason right there. So I call that four because it's easy to do that. That robust dialogue, I, I can't miss because I know what they want and I design it. Um, and then that leads to five, which is the, you know, that organic and really strong word of mouth endorsements. You know, again, that I own the dinner party and, and people talking and there because everyone chirps every single person on the planet chirps and so what we want to do is sort of not control but guide how they chirp and um and we do that you know just it's it's uh you know got conversational currency people like you start to talk about virtual reality people lean in they want to they want to hear about it too and it and, and again that's free marketing you know because my ideal clients are friends with other people and they're probably not too far away from also ideal clients. So again, I'm, you know, it's a word of mouth is just, is incredible. And let me give yeah. you one example. Can I, I know I've been. Yeah, please, please. So what you're saying, and this is going to be the example is that, uh, you know, people are so excited after what they see that they're just spreading the news. They're painting the town. Right. They're sharing, sharing. Oh, and it, and it's, we're doing. we saw the VR and, and Right. Isn't that and the other? So tell me the story of what happened. Yeah, so it's experiences like this one. So I'm working with a, a client and and I'm trying to explain to her the way I want this house to kind of unfold. So and and this is something that you know, can, Peter, did you make this up? No. Architects do this all the time, but it's not easy to explain this. So the first view of the house, you know, that curb appeal, that's important. Right. Ten out of ten importance. No, no question. So I, I want the guests to come up and see that and be super impressed. Right. But then as they walk towards the front door, I want it to go to a 12. OK, so so it has to be elevated. And then when they open the door, I want it to be a 13, maybe a 14. And then as they walk maybe into the family room or whatever it is, then it's a 20. Right. So it's got to be one, two, three, four. And I'm explaining this to to her. 
and, and I'm walking her through in virtual reality. So here's the 10. Oh, it looks great. Here's the 12. Oh yeah, no, that's definitely higher than a 10. Here's the 13. Totally get it. Love this, love that. And walk into the family room. Here's the 20. I think it's a 30. Right. And so, <laughs> right. And, and so the, the whole idea is that, that I can't do that. And, uh, you know, I've done that every single project since the, you know, I was 20. So that's not a new experience, you know, to, to escalate to, to the crescendo, right? That's what architects do, right? That's not a, that's not new, but the way to explain it so that the client totally gets it and is a hundred percent on board, that's what's new. And, um, and again, the, uh, the conversation. So, so we talked about in that conversation, how to do the front door slightly differently because she liked it, but it wasn't private enough for her. She wanted the front door to be open and private. And so we figured that out too. Um, and, and it, but again, it's so, it's so easy because we, I moved slightly to the right of the front door and you could then see into the family room all the way through the foyer and all that kind of stuff. And she goes, there's our mistake right there. We're giving away the, the, the 30 before they even get in the house. And so we solved that. And she was right. You know, we weren't giving it all away, but we were giving some of it away. So, but, but again, that's the kind of, like, when I say robust back and forth dialogue, that's what we get. Um, and she's talking about it all over. I mean, you know, she can't stop talking about it, which is, again, that's, that's what we all want. Um, but we want the conversations to be natural, like organic conversations that, you know, she's going to go out to dinner with her friends and, um, and it's just going to come up. It can't not, you know, cause it's that exciting. Whereas if I shown her drawings, maybe that comes up, maybe it doesn't, you know, uh, and, and even if she's happy, it's just not a, yeah, it's, a, it's the drawings, you know, but when you put the goggles on, it changes everything. So. Yeah. Peter, there was, so there's a book, Rework, and it was written by the, the guys who developed, they were actually graphic designers, they got into software development, and then they developed this project management app called Basecamp, and, and they have all these software tools and everything, but they've also written books, and what's really interesting, in that book, they talk about the concept that as a business, you're creating assets and IP as you go, as you develop systems, as you develop processes, as you do certain things. And this is something that here at Business of Architecture, we've always been very interested in encouraging architects to do, which is to not to, to continue to offer the services that they offer, but what are some of the, the spin-offs or the side effects of the work that you're doing that you can leverage for income or exposure or strategic advantage, et cetera. And as a matter of fact, you've done that with your expertise in VR. And last year, I believe, you actually launched a, a training course teaching architects, basically helping them shortcut the process. So they don't have to figure all this out on their own, but it's a step-by-step -step guide to be able to get VR set up very quickly, understand the pros and the cons. How did that come about? I mean, what inspired you to do that, and how has that worked out for you? Can you tell us about that? Yeah, so it was, it was an interesting um, conversation. So, uh, so my business partners, Eric Bobro, who I know you know, um, he Your and mutual I, friend, absolutely, yeah, exactly. And so we, he and I were talking, and um, and I don't remember if he brought up the conversation or if I did, um, but either way, it doesn't matter. And we thought there was an opportunity here, and the the question was, was it a good idea for me to kind of give away, if you will, the um, the competitive advantage? And I never even thought twice about that because. To me, it's it's more of um, what I want is, you know, that at some point in the not too distant future that every single project by every single architect is all on virtual reality. So and the answer to the question of, you know, is that going to take 20 years? Maybe, but it's not going to be 21 years, right? Is it going to be 10 years? But by 20 years, yes, every project, all of them on virtual reality, because it's not that difficult. So. You know, the, well, I, I'll say it slightly differently. With, um, you can do it the way I did it, which is that long slog and back and forth and make mistakes. And, you know, we did virtual reality projects that we never showed our clients because they just weren't good enough, right? And so, but we were learning. And so we were trying to get better. And then um, we, we finally did um, show our first clients. And it was, you know, again, it, we were ready, you know, but that probably took a year. 
maybe more um, before I felt like like that like the virtual reality was um, as good as the actual home, right? So that was the that was the point. And um, so I, that was probably the start of the conversation. Is, you know, Eric and I were talking about that. And then he asked, you know, would that be something that I could teach? And it never occurred to me that that would be something other people would want to know until probably he said those words. And then everything kind of clicked into place like, oh, of course, everyone would want a short circuit that year, year and a half, whatever it was, and, and take the fastest route possible to the, you know, to the to the promised land or whatever. And, um, and yeah, so we did a, a course probably sometime in like, I want to say June or something like that. And, um, and we taught about 170 architects, something like that. And we're about ready to roll out a second one, which I'm super excited about because I'd never taught anyone anything. <laughs> and, um, and then, so my son and daughter will say, no, you taught me how to ride a bike. Okay. Take that off the table. Um, but the um, so to me, it was learning how to teach at the same time. And we did it all with Zoom, which is a little bit unusual. You know, I can't see people's reactions. I can't see their body language. I can't see anything. Um, so that was a that was a learning, you know, how to keep people engaged and all that. And Eric was very helpful with that, too. So this is what I do when I do this. And here's, you know, I want you to focus on this and that kind of stuff. Um, and now we're ready to do, you know, the same course 2.0. Um, and again, you know, you know, I, I think and maybe architects would agree that the built environment, specifically here in America, it's not as good as maybe the built environment in Europe is. And part of that reason is that design isn't valued as much now as when Europe did a lot of building 100 years ago. So and how do we up that level of design? I think one way to do it is virtual reality, just to to show the how beautiful design can be, how aspirational, how transforming all of that. And, um, and then when it isn't, that's obvious in virtual reality too. So, you know, it's, it's a little bit, you know, when you're selling two cars and you're not allowed to do a test drive and you're only allowed to look at 2d images of the two cars, wouldn't you know, the cheaper one's going to win every time, you know, but as soon as you get in the car and you feel what it's like to go into a, 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 a curve or something like that, oh, that gets my heart racing in, um, you know, then it becomes like, well, maybe that car is worth more money, you know? And so, you know, I've seen, you know, people, you know, my clients have changed their budgets based on, you know, I design what they want and then they see it and then they say, okay, I get it. That's, that's what I want. That is exactly what I want. So to me, that's a, a win, win, win. You know, I don't like not hitting budgets, but I really don't like you know, missing the expectations. That's, that's the real loss. So, so back to VR for architects. So VR for architects started, um, and we're, you know, going into that second round, I would say late spring, maybe early summer, depending on <laughs> when I get my act together. Um, and, you know, Eric and I have already talked about that. And, um, so it's a, it's just a, it's, it's, we're, we're, we're just having, um, it's rewarding to help elevate the profession a little bit. You know, again, I'm not, uh, uh, and frankly, sometimes I wish somebody else could do it, right? But no one else is doing it. So, you know, to me, you know, I've got plenty of work. I've got all this, you know, I don't need this kind of thing. But um, our last class um, was just a couple of weeks ago, actually. And, uh, and I decided to take other people's virtual reality models and make them better. So two of the students like submitted their, you know, their ARCHICAD models and their twin motion models. And then I took them for, you know, just a little bit of time. And then in the class showed what I would do. And the results were amazing. You know, so the, um, so Chris, who, you know, works with me, took the ARCHICAD model. There were issues. So we, you know, and the issues usually have to do with surfaces. The surfaces in ARCHICAD out of the box don't work. So we create at least, I guess we're up to a hundred now, 
new surfaces so we can control them very specifically. And then, um, so Chris did that. Then I went in and, you know, put the right lights in the right places and did everything that I always do and created these beautiful environments. And the, the one guy said he, he knew the house was beautiful, but he'd never conceived of it the way I did. And, um, you know, very cinematically and, and, and that, you know, again, when you, when you show a house that way, your clients then see it that way too, because they will not imagine more than whatever it is that we show them. They can't. So, so we have to elevate that, the, the, the presentation. So in any case, so Ken was super happy with the, with the work I'd done on his model. And then I just sent it right back to him. So now he's got this work done. And then the same thing with the other guy, his name was Rick. And, um, and they were, you know, you know, just were pushing them forward. And I could see in their models, you know, that towards the end of the first year where I was, you know, there, it's not, it was not uh, hard to see. Oh yeah. I used to do that too. Uh, I thought I said not to do that in the class. And, um, and, you know, but when people see it with their own model, it becomes really a visceral experience. So, so the classes are working out great. And, and, um, and I'm again, excited to get started. And, and I think it's like a, in a month or so, we'll have the second one up and running. That, Where can people go to find out about the course if they want to s learn more about it or start to offer virtual reality themselves? Yeah. So VR for architects. So VR, F O R architects, VR for architects.com. And, um, and you know, there's all kinds of information there to, you know, there's some interviews with Eric and I and, and, you know, you could see, I don't know, Eric's got all that stuff figured out. And, and it's a, it's a nice experience going to the, um, to the website. And then we use the website for class members too. So there are parts that you won't be able to get to, you know, I put up models and that kind of thing. And, um, Chris and I, this is a, a little bit of a funny story. So the, the idea was for me not to use one of my client's homes in the, um, uh, for the, for the course. Right. But I needed something. So I was, uh, my wife was driving and I was thinking, well, what if I did this? And, and I started to design this house in my mind and that the house had to be relatively simple to draw and to model because we're doing it for free. At this point, there was no course and it had to be super cool because it had to attract architects. Right. So it had to be like one thing that an architect would go, Ooh, that's cool. <laughs> And, uh, and then, so how could I do that? And I uh, came up with what we then nicknamed the waterfall house. And, um, and it's just a, it's a beautiful contemporary home that, uh, that just looks and feels like an architect designed it. And, um, uh, and then Chris liked it too, cause it's like, oh, I can model this, I can do this, we can do that. And we can use this piece from that house and this piece from this house and da 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 da. And, and so it didn't take very long to do either the model or the design, you know, and it shows the kinds of things, but what I didn't want to do, and I, I've seen this in many, um, um, tutorials with, with Archicad is just one example. It's like a, a real stupid, here's a house, here's a 45, uh, you know, uh, 12, 12 roof, 12, 12 roof, one window here, one door there. And now we're done. It's like, yeah, I'm just not excited. And, uh, so I wanted something that would push that forward a little bit and, and we got, it's, it's a dramatic house, which is good. Yeah. It's just amazing how easily, and I know it's not easy, but compared to before right. Peter, in terms of your work, where can they go to find out about 2E Architects? So 2E-Architects.com. So the number two letter E-Architects.com. And, um, and that's actually one last thing to add is that as soon as you, if you are using virtual reality and it's not on your website, you know, the, the, the question is what's the difference between someone who's illiterate and someone who chooses not to read? And the answer is nothing. So what's the difference between someone who uses virtual reality and doesn't put it on their website and someone who can't use virtual reality? And the answer is nothing. So, oh, right. Oh. Right. So you, Ouch. right. And so the, okay. the Right. So the whole idea is you have to get it out there get it on the homepage and that, and they'll see that what I'm doing and I'm working on, um, a video right now. Uh, literally I'm in the voiceover stages, all that for, to, to complete another video that'll be on the website and be circulating all about, 
you know, virtual reality and all that stuff. So there's already um, plenty of on there, but I'm leaning in because again, the, the response. So it's, it's good stuff. Great. Well, Peter, thank you again for being back on the show and we look forward to having you back on episode 700 and something. <laughs> Excellent. Look forward to it. Okay. Yeah. Enoch, thank you very, very much. And that's a wrap. If you enjoyed today's show, please head on over to iTunes and leave us a review. I read every single one. Also, I'd love to get your feedback on this particular episode or the show in general, as well as your recommendations. You can reach us by emailing podcast at businessofarchitecture.com. This podcast is brought to you by Business of Architecture, a leading architect business consultancy. Access our free training on how to structure your architecture firm for more freedom, fulfillment, and financial success by going to smartpracticemethod.com. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, warranty, pledge, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.